The AI assistants have simplified that task for us. There is no more researching, keyword, translating. You can type whatever you're thinking or say whatever you're thinking. When we make life simpler, don't you think that our human competency over time will get impeded? I don't think human minds can ever be subsumed by an AI. We're either going to destroy what works or we will create something better than what exists. But I do believe uh, we are at an intersection where we're gonna find out over the next five to ten years really what's the limit with which AI can go. Storing stuff, memorizing it is completely useless. In fact, we should not spend any amount of time trying to memorize and remember. It's not intelligence. Hello friends. I bring to you greetings from B Cubed Shori. And I also bring to you Sabir Bhatia who's going to break some boundaries with Nile Varma, our very special guest. Welcome, Nile. Thank you. To our show today on the future of AI in human interactions. So friends, Nile Varma is the CEO and co-founder of Primus Partners, a consultant by career who ha who's had leadership roles in PwC, Accenture, KPMG, organizations like that. He has pioneered in setting up perhaps what is the largest and first global Indian consulting house called Primus Partners. He believes that to make a change at scale, you not only need uh, intent, but policies and programs that align initiatives with incentives, uh, you know, that can drive cultures. So thank you, uh, Nile, for being here with us. My pleasure. For this show today. The first question, obviously, is uh, what I mean. What what is what is AI in human interaction? Yeah, I think AI in, in human interaction is about, in some senses, mimicking human behaviors to be able to solve problems of today and perhaps tomorrow. Uh, fundamentally, AI in context of human behavior allows to understand human intent, emotions in a much more meaningful manner than we have ever seen before. Wonderful. That's, uh, I, I may add. Well put. Yes, of course. Um, AI in uh, human interactions uh, today takes two forms. One is the form of a chatbot, which has seen an explosion in the last four or five years. You've got all these chatbots, starting with ChatGPT and Gemini, Cloud, Copilot. And the other form of the communication is voice. Like you said, you know, uh, whether you speak to your car and ask for navigation directions or Alexa in your home uh, or your uh, refrigerator or your TV, you know. So devices are... Uh, getting a becoming AI enabled through the human interface of a chat or voice. And that is the, you know, uh, the manifestation of AI uh, in human communications. Wonderful. That is the question I was going to ask you about uh, virtual AI, virtual assistants, and how are they effective in uh, enhancing human communication? It, no, I, I think Sabir is absolutely right. Essentially, when machines can understand your commands in the natural language or text that you would do is what we would call AI in human, react, human interaction. Uh, absolutely. And previously, we, you know, we used to use uh, typed text you know, to get that response. And or we had to do some sort of effort. For example, if we had an idea that we were researching, um, you know, uh, we would uh, go to Google, uh, type a whole bunch of uh, 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 keywords that were most associated with what we were thinking, and then we would get, you know, 10, 15, 20, whatever articles. Then we would go through all of them and figure out what question we were trying to get answered, uh, we would take that response and collect the collective responses and make an, a decision or an opinion and whether we wrote that in the form of an email or report or 
used it to make our decision. Today, the AI assistants have simplified that task for us. There is no more researching, keyword, translating. You can type whatever you're thinking or say whatever you're thinking. I want to know which are the top five uh, best recipes for uh, an Easter dinner. Boom. The, all the back-end research will be done by uh, these AI assistants. They'll come back with the five recommendations. And if at most, I mean, that, that's where they not, may, may not all be right. But they'll give you your, the answer you're looking for in an easily collated, collected, researched, their own research kind of form. And if you want to you know, just make sure and verify that this is okay, you type that same query in three or four virtual assistants. And then compare it all of them and say, more or less, this is what they're saying. So uh, it removes the whole burden of, uh, you know, thinking through an issue in your mind. But you can just speak your mind, if you will. Sabir and gentlemen, both of you, point for both of you to sort of deliberate over. You know, the human body and the human mind has certain competencies or is supposed to have certain competencies. When we make life simpler, like you said, life simpler, life easier, what is the impact of making life simpler and easier and all these chatbots and virtual assistants on our human competencies? Don't you think that our human competencies over time will get impeded? Or is that the evolutionary way? I mean, uh, is that inevitable? We, uh, from you first, Nile, and then Sabir will respond to you know, coming from India, a land which is often referred to as Jugar, I don't think human mind can ever be subsumed by an AI. I personally don't believe that because we are either going to destroy what works or we will create something better than what exists. So I personally don't believe that's going to be true, Javed. But I do believe uh, we are in an intersection where we're going to find out over the next five to ten years really what's the limit with which AI can go and actually uh, undertake many of the things that we as humans currently do in our jobs, in our education, in any settings that we currently work in. And then and during this period we'll also get to know what else do we need to do to remain relevant. Because as humans, we always want to remain relevant. So I think it, as AI evolves, so would the human ingenuity. I would also say another thing, Javed, you know, to the previous point uh, Sabir made. Uh, I think if the difference is if I as a consultant wanted to search which country has the best tourism strategy, I'm going to go to Google. It's going to give me results versus going to chat GPT, which is going to give me the output that I need. And I think that's the big difference between the generational shift in how AI is responding to the same query. I have a different uh, or a slightly modified response to the Jugard answer. I'm like, is Jugard necessary? I mean, or is it being overly smart on things that you need not be overly smart on? I mean, you're, it's like, Cutting corners or trying to fit A with B or he said, she said is, I mean, in the long run, it doesn't serve you that well. And so I would say that what these kind of AI assistants do is remove the obvious decision making to saying, you know, it is good. This is what is most likely. This is what is the best outcome for two people. Let's not try to one up on each other, but do what is good for all of society and then it frees our mind to then think of other problems not just mundane, mundane survival problems not just trying to figure out if this guy is pulling a fast one or lying to me or doing this I mean that's the beauty of uh, these AI assistants if looked in a positive sense without the bias you know that uh, it, it, it really 
frees the mind uh, from the day-to-day -day interactions and obvious things uh, you know that are predictable you know that humans would do or should be doing uh, so as to create a better society you know for example uh, Nile when I mentioned this one of the things that came to my mind was uh, I do still recall around the time he uh, invented hotmail uh, the mobile phone had also just mobile telephony in India had taken off and when I had my initial mobile phone the very very initial one uh, you know, the directory had to be sort of gotten into and it wasn't so easy to get into the directory and put so many thousands of numbers in your directory. So one remembered 10 digit numbers. Now, does anybody remember 10 digit numbers? What to say 10 digit, 5 digit, 6 digit? Why? The reason is because something is so easily, uh, technology has brought to us something so easily that's available that we don't think of straining our memory. So if you don't strain a faculty, does it not impede? I think, Javed, in your question, there is an assumption that that's the best use of memory. But just an example. I know, but I am saying that's the assumption we've made. Now, if you have something available, now, you may say that in the context of mobile phone, but you could go back 10 years back and you could say it in the context of when computerization, as we used to call it, came in the context of financial services. So I think that's the natural progression. But I would argue to say that, and I see my kids, right? I have two young daughters, and I would see them using their mental faculty much more than I do, recognizing that they don't remember numbers, but they recognize patterns because their mind today is exposed to the amount of data information that they have to read one page to understand and appreciate which either two could take 10 pages 20 pages 500 pages etc so i think their mental faculties has developed much more to be able to see the patterns which in the evolution of mankind is what would lead to creative economy. Though, I, would, I would add some more to yeah, it, yeah. in fact. Hidden in your question is actually a very deep uh, question about intelligence. And um, it comes back to knowledge-based versus inquiry-based. You know, we, when we grew up, uh, were taught yeah, we, we watched quizzes, how well people responded in quizzes or in spelling competitions or like spelling bee in the US. I would argue that's like a useless use of the brain. Storing stuff, memorizing it is completely useless. In fact, we should not, you know, spend any amount of time trying to memorize and remember. It's not intelligence. Intelligence is coming up with original ideas, original thought from something that does not even exist. So, like what Nile said, not having to remember numbers may free our mind to think of more substantial problems than remembering, rem remembering numbers. And that's what she sees in his two daughters. They are creative. They can analyze situations. They can make intelligent decisions. They may not be able to remember any numbers, but uh, they know more. They are more. They are wiser in terms of worldliness. What took us 40, 50 years it may take them only 17 years to get to the same, you know, level of wisdom that has taken us much longer. So, yeah, if if I can, John, please, just please, please, just please, to please. add to the point. For example, today I watch young kids, both from school and college, being able to express, understand, appreciate data in a much better way than we used to. That's because they have developed mental faculty which has learned to question why rather than to learn how. Right. And I think, so So my view is, I, yes, there are other challenges that will come across when we use AI, in, in, but not necessarily that it's going to make our minds regressive. I think the challenge would be whether some of this reduces people-to-people -people contact. 
I think that's the challenge which is perhaps much bigger than whether it's going to make our mind less useful. So analytical ability gets enhanced is what you're saying. All right, fine, accept it. Then there is, a, you spoke about uh, the spirit of inquiry, right? You take a subject and you go out exploring, reading, experiencing, and then coming back, you know, with, with a very well informed mind. What, what is chat GPT going to do to it, the spirit of inquiry? Because if I need to uh, do a lot of work to arrive at certain conclusions, now all that will get, uh, I can take a shortcut, I can go to chat GPT, so my 